What did they steal? I love that Gollum is insulted with Faramir for even asking. You're a stupid son of Denethor not to listen to any of my self dialogue. Stupid son of Denethor. I opened with this clip because this is what my newborn son does when I've stolen this precious. Filthy thieves. I'm Eric Moss and this is The Deep Dive, a channel that dives deep into the films we love to find new overlooked details and hidden layers of meaning. After taking a break for our family time with my newborn son, because I'm no Denethor, Thor, I'm gonna love my kid. I'm back for the second installment of our three-part analysis of Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings Extended Editions because we're doing this properly. The Two Towers holds a special place in my heart for having the trilogy's best sequence of Helm's Deep, the best speech of Sam at Oskilia, and spotlighting the best character of Gollum. But really I love it because Peter Jackson and his co-writers Fran Walsh and Philip Boyens were forced to take Tolkien's story structure into their own hands, more than they had to for Fellowship or Return of the King, and they ended up producing an equally epic three and a half hours of cinema. And that includes reframing what the Two Towers even are. Two Towers is not about toppling the pillars of our enemies, it's about toppling our own. And to celebrate this Lord of the Rings series on the Deep Dive channel, we have special shirts that I absolutely love. The first of them is this Gollum themed Worth the Deep Dive shirt. It's the best way you can support what I'm trying to do here at the Deep Dive. Grab it at nerdriot.shop. I'll get to the second shirt design later. We open on the peaks of the Misty Mountains as we hear the voices echoing from Moria beneath the rock, and revisiting Gandalf's duel with the Balrog from Fellowship. When we were going through that moment in the previous film, we felt the terror of being alone in the depths, but now we glide back from the sunny sky as if to say another observer might be witnessing these events from above. I think it's because this Istari Gandalf does not end here. He will be brought back from death by Eru Iluvatar, the creator deity superior to the Valar. I believe we are beginning this film from Eru's perspective perspective as he watches over his beloved wizard. We replay this epic moment. Followed by the Balrog's whip snatching Gandalf's ankle and Gandalf whispering, Fly, you fools. And it is advice they will take in this film because throughout the movie, no one ever stops moving. There is so much running. Peter Jackson said that the imagery of Gandalf confronting the Balrog on the bridge and the drop was based on a painting by John Howe for the Lord of the Rings card game. Artists John Howe and Alan Lee were arguably the two biggest visual influences that Peter Jackson drew upon while he was making this movie. But now we get to see the second half of the duel. According to the book's timeline, Gandalf spent like 10 days pursuing the Balrog through Moria before he finally cast him down. And listen to the moment when Gandalf catches his sword glamdring. Yes, that metallic hum as it flies past the camera. It's all so great. Following this is this glorious shot to the Balrog's flames gradually filling the underground cavern and reflecting off the water of the lake. Howard Shore's music track throughout these opening minutes was titled Glamdring after Gandalf's sword, and this section with the chanting is called The Abyss, and the lyrics are actually in the dwarf language of Kuzdul, and they translate to, can breach it, comes from it, only an endless darkness rises deep from the beginnings of the world, nor step too close, the silence take you. And the lyrics actually end in the elf language of Quenya, translating to, to the end, servant of fire, for you must fight to the end. Now, when they hit the water, we come out of Frodo's eyes as he awakens, but originally Peter Jackson conceived of a slime Balrog that would have formed when he hit the water, but they didn't have the budget for it. So Frodo wakes up from these visions, shouting Gandalf and telling Sam it was nothing. Just a dream. Yes, Gandalf did survive longer to fight the Balrog, but this particular imagery was Frodo's subjective fanfiction of how that fight went down. We need to tell ourselves these stories to keep us going. It's what Sam's really talking about in his amazing speech at the end of this film. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. And we see Gandalf as one of those stubborn warriors from one of the epic myths. The extended edition includes this scene with Frodo and Sam using the elvish rope to descend the cliff. Remember, this was Sam's gift from Galadriel. And while he says that it doesn't loosen easily, the fact that it does is actually the point of it. With the proper tug, elvish rope, it's designed to untie so that you can carry it with you. But Sam's misunderstanding of how to use this rope will extend to him using it as just a leash for Gollum. And notice later, Gollum is like, it burns us! And it's because Gollum hates everything elf 
made. He finds the Lembus bread disgusting. He avoids touching their cloaks. So Sam misuses something that is supposed to be practical as something that is just arguably wasted on Gollum because all it does is just bring him even more pain and discomfort. But even more important, I would say, to this extended edition scene is this detail, the salt that Sam carries from the Shire to give them a taste of home. It's these little details that make Sam an essential partner for Frodo. Without the ability to remember and to taste the Shire, the inability to remember the stories they grew up hearing, Bilbo's stories, Frodo would be lost mentally and forget what they are fighting for and give in to the ring. Jackson said that these close-ups of Frodo seeing the Eye of Sauron and grabbing the ring were actually shot in the studio soundstage two years later than the rest of it. So this shot of Frodo drinking, we're back to the shot that they shot outside, which is why their hair and their skin look slightly different. And then entering the film is Gollum. The shot of him descending the cliff with the crescent moon is actually the first shot of Andy Serkis' as Gollum, as Serkis wasn't cast as a character until they were shooting scenes for films two and three. Initially, they shot this bare cliff with no one on it, and they CGI'd him on it later. Originally, Gollum was going to be a fully CGI character, like what we saw in the Fellowship prologue, but Jackson was so impressed by Andy Serkis' audition tape that they completely reconceived how to bring the character to life using Serkis on set for motion capture and redesigning the CGI model's face to reflect Circus's facial features, as he would have been playing the Smeagol that transitioned into this Gollum. Now, Circus obviously cannot crawl upside down like a lizard, so this specific movement wasn't done by him. It was fully CGI, but his wrestling with Frodo and Sam and most of the stunts were all done by Andy Circus. They shot it once with Circus in frame wearing the mocap suit, and then again with the other actors pantomiming without Circus in the shot. And then for the final shot, they rotoscoped the CGI Gollum over Circus's body movements. But to date, I believe the close-ups of Gollum look incredibly vivid. They completely hold up, and really it's because back in 2001, they invested in the time to get it right. Doesn't matter if CGI technology has gotten better since then, if future movies just kind of rush it, you can totally tell, and that's why things age poorly. But if you look at movies like this or Jurassic Park, because they took the time to make it look good and mix in practical elements, that's what makes these visuals timeless. Each frame of Gollum's face for this movie took four hours to render, but it's also in the design. They smartly designed Gollum with massive eyes and deep expressive pupils, pupils that you'll notice alternatively open up and then construct Strict, which is how we discern between his vulnerable Smeagol self and his bitter Gollum persona. And with details like Sam's Shire salt and the stink of the bog that they had smelled, these opening minutes of Two Towers do a really good job activating our olfactory senses so that we can almost smell the stink of Gollum as they're wrestling with him. Like you can feel Sam and Frodo being like, ugh, I don't even want to touch this freak. But I absolutely love the close-up of Gollum biting his upper lip, blowing out his cheeks. It's a subtle gesture that shows his ravenous desperation. Like Frodo now gets an up-close glimpse at his own possible future. Frodo draws Bilbo's sword Sting upon Gollum, an image that Jackson actually got from an Alan Lee painting, but it's another example of the value of remembering stories. Frodo, having listened to Bilbo's tales and recalling Gollum's history with Bilbo in Sting, is an asset to finally getting Gollum to submit. And we gotta appreciate Circus emoting through this transition. <laughs> Yes, you can see his pupils transitioning from narrow to dilating, open, and vulnerable in defeat. Now, Gollum would be almost 600 years old, the average Hobbit lifespan of 100 years extended by the ring. He speaks often in the third person as the ring has divided his mind into two, but when he says I, Frodo believes it's a better-natured Smeagol having the upper hand in that moment. Gollum leads Frodo and Sam toward Mordor, while Merry and Pippin remain captives of the Uruk-hai and orcs who grab them at Amon Hin. The one on the right is actually played by Sala Baker, who also played Sauron in the Fellowship prologue. To leave a trail, Pippin bites off the elven brooch given to all the Fellowship by Galadriel, something that we saw more of in the extended edition. And Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli find this brooch. Not idly do the leaves of Lorien fall. Ah, this line comes directly from Tolkien, and it evokes the motif of falling leaves in the autumnal imagery in Rivendell, reflecting the seasonal shift that all the elves feel as they plan their departure from Middle-earth. But Aragorn reframes these leaves falling not as just happenstance, but as a beacon of hope to fight onward. They hop up on the ridge. Rohan, home of the host lords. And we hear the first hint of Howard Shore's Rohan theme. And I love how there's like this inherent gallop to the melody. I always hear it as, giddy up right now, we're horse boys. And by the way, the second of the two exclusive shirt designs that we've created for the Deep Dive channel for this video series is our amazing horse boy <laughs> shirt. Grab one of these at nerdriot.shop and you too can be a horse boy. Or get it for the horse boy in your life because we all know one.
Legolas gets a better look. They're taking the hobbits to Isengard. And notice how even when these three are not running, Peter Jackson keeps the camera moving. Like in this shot, he dollies the camera to the right past Orlando Bloom to maintain the urgency and the speed of this pursuit. We check back in with Saruman and Isengard using the Palantir and connecting with Sauron, represented with the great eye atop Baradur. This is our first visual representation of the two towers of this movie's title. In Tolkien's text, the two towers that he referred to were implied to be Saruman's Tower of Orthanc and Isengard here, but instead of Baradur, Mina as Morgul, but Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh and Philip Boyens conceived of the interpretation of the fiery eye of Sauron atop Baradur in order to give Sauron a physical threat and a tangible link to his ally of Saruman. When this trilogy was being marketed in the early aughts, Peter Jackson was pressured by the studio to change the name of the second film to avoid associations with the 9-11 attacks, but Peter Jackson held firm. It's just kind of interesting to look back at the way movies like Spider-Man removed a sequence set in the World Trade Center towers and Lilo and Stitch re-edited a plane crash sequence, but Peter Jackson felt, no, our view viewers are going to know what these two towers are referring to, and it's important to this story for our heroes to feel flanked by the twin gazes of Undyne Evil and Undyne Evil's puppet. Jackson repurposes shots from Fellowship of Saruman's forces felling trees and birthing Urukai, and now we see his new source. The forest of Fangorn lies on our doorstep. Burn it! Saruman underestimates the resolve of the inhabitants of the forest of Fengorn, and the dam that we just heard him ordering to erect will also spell his doom. Saruman mobilizes the wild men of Dunland to raid the plains. This shows that the minions who serve Saruman and Sauron are not just all evil, mindless drones. A lot of them include these desperate men who have been driven off their land by the Rohirrim and now just motivated by settling the score. So Saruman is really smartly taking advantage of Rohan's enemies to weaken their hold on the land. And we meet this Rohirrim mother, Morwen, who sends her children, Thane and Frida to Edoras. The family will later be reunited at Helm's Deep. Carl Urban plays Aomer, finding his slain Rohirrim brethren at the fords of Isen, including Theodrid, son of the King Theoden. Jackson included this moment to show the confusion among the scrambled Rohirrim. While everyone assumed these forces were from Mordor, his discovery of the White Hand of Saruman tells him that they are dealing with a new threat that's being bred next door. As with Boromir, we have another example of the elder son, the expected heir, dying, leaving it to the fathers and to other relatives to carry the burden. Aomer and his sister Eowyn are nephew and niece to Theoden. They were adopted by the king. Advising Theoden is Grima Wormtongue, played by Brad Dourif, who, in my opinion, might be the most talented actor on the call sheet. Like, no offense to Christopher Lee or anyone else in the cast, they're all great. I just really recommend you check out Brad Dourif's work in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Blue Velvet, and Deadwood as a psychic serial killer, Luther Lee Boggs in the X-Files Beyond the Sea episode, or maybe just as the voice of Chucky in the Child's Play franchise. Dourif shaved his eyebrows to play Wormtongue and he's so expressive with his eyes. Your uncle is wearied by your malcontent, your warmongering. Yes, that little twitch on the word malcontent. Wormtongue banishes Aomer, claiming an order from the king, whose clearly forced signature trails off the page, and we are reminded visually of the haunting, they are coming, scrawled by Ori in the book of Mazarbul in Fellowship. The ink similarly dragged across the page, because we are really seeing an age here where the written record doesn't even have the time or the stamina to neatly document this downfall. Merry and Pippin, meanwhile, hear the ints in the distance as the orcs argue about whether or not to eat them. What about their legs? I don't need those. This orc was apparently voiced by Andy Serkis, and these orcs now turn on each other. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys! <laughs> Yes, many have pointed out that the word menu being in their vocabulary would imply the existence of orc restaurants. But you know what? Hey, why not? Maybe there was like a cook orc who would write out what that day's menu would be on like a sandwich board in front of the food line and they all just fondly remember that. But the Rohirrim arrives and wipes out the camp and for a moment we are left thinking Merry and Pippin get trampled and burned as Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli catch up with Aomer's group. And we get this great shot of the Rohirrim all turning back across the hill which Jackson wanted to look like a flock of birds in a kind of natural unison. The Rohirrim's helmet and spears and embroidery, their long blonde hair braids, were inspired by Scandinavian designs, which Peter Jackson's team introduced to give these horse lords some more grounded realism. Like, I will never get over how sick Aylmer's helmet looks with a centerpiece as the head of a horse. Horse boys! <laughs> Aylmer tells them that Saruman has poisoned these lands. The white wizard is cunning. He walks here and there, they say. There's an old man hooded and cloaked. 
This line sets up the reveal of Gandalf the White instead of Saruman. Tolkien, as a devout Catholic, loaded his text with Christian symbolism, and Gandalf's resurrection was meant to parallel Christ's resurrection, which in Acts of the Apostles, for days, Jesus coming back was spoken of like gossip and speculation, like no one really believed it at first. But in Tolkien's text, there is mention of a stooped man in a hat that startles their horses, and that man was never identified, but it was suggested to be Saruman walking around. Or was it Gandalf? We don't really know. Aomer believes his forces killed Merry and Pippin, so as a kind of penance, he gifts them with these two horses, and notice that as he mounts his horse, if you look closely as the camera angles up to him, the sword totally falls off of its scabbard. And then he says, But do not trust to hope. It has forsaken these lands. Yes, the abandonment and the restoration of hope is an important theme in Two Towers. Thematically, you could look at the two towers of the film as like despair and hope. All of these characters are in a different way on a journey between those two towers. But right now we are fully in despair. They ride up to the burnt carcasses where the severed head of an uruk -hai greets them. The censored TV version of this movie actually replaces this head with a helmet. Believing Merry and Pippin to be dead, Legolas prays. This translates to, may they find peace in death. Meanwhile, Aragorn, after showing restraint after Gandalf died, remember, and perhaps because he barked at Merry and Pippin to stop crying, now he cannot hold back. Yep, that scream from Viggo Mortensen is because he broke his toe upon kicking that helmet. A piece of trivia I'm sure I did not have to tell you. Everyone knows that. Aragorn retraces Merry and Pippin's steps, and this shot of them running under the horse is an example of what I identified in my Jurassic Park deep dive, a how the f did they do this shot? Like, look at this. I assume it was CGI, but it looks really, really good. The other three look up at Fangord Forest. In the lower left corner, you could see the graves of five Rohirrim riders who had died the night before. Aomer gave them this ritualistic burial. And I appreciate this detail because yeah, it was totally a battle. It's unlikely they would have killed all these orcs without some casualties. Merry and Pippin meet Treebeard. <laughs> So the word burarum is an entish utterance described as a deep rumbling noise like a discord on a great organ, meaning a noise of disgust. So Treebeard, whom Peter Jackson described as his favorite character design, other than Gollum, of course, is an ent. Ents are an old race of tree-like creatures that are actually considered the shepherds of the trees. Peter Jackson actually adapted portions of the character Old Man Willow from the Fellowship section, who was omitted from the first film, but Old Man Willow is considered a horn, which is a separate sentient tree species beside the ents that thinks that the ants care after. So the ants kind of serve a necessary function. They are the bulwarks of the forest that keep the rest of the forest from coming after men and becoming too unruly. Treebeard is voiced by Gimli actor Jonathan Rhys Davies. They actually played his voice from a speaker through a large complex wooden box to give it this tree-like resonance. It was actually believed that Tolkien based Treebeard's mannerisms on his friend C.S. Lewis, author of the Chronicle of Narnia books, who apparently had a loud booming voice and a huge stride. The wide shots were of course CGI, but they built an animatronic for close-ups, and that's why the little details of the leaves shaking on his branches come through, like the design of the T-Rex in Jurassic Park, taking the time to build an animatronic version of it, and using that with the visual illusion of the CGI is what brings the full package to life. Now, I'm a new father, and that means I value sleep more than ever before. Marlow pillows have been a game changer for me, and even if you don't have an adorable agent of chaos in your life, they will be for you too. Marlow pillows are made by the founders of Brooklinen, who spent seven years doing research to develop the people's pillow and it shows. A thing that I didn't know that I needed in my pillow that I now cannot do without is the option to customize it. So these Marlowe pillows are super easy to adjust. Now currently I have it zipped up for a firmer pillow, but check it out. You can unzip it and then you give it some room to stretch out and you get like a more plush pillow. <gasps> it's that easy. Or you zip it up and suddenly it's like a more firmer pillow. This is so freaking cool. Whether you sleep on your stomach or your back or your side, or even if you like switch it up every night. One Marlow pillow is all you need. Marlow pillows give you optimal support and help prevent neck and back pain, meaning you get better sleep, which helps your health, your mood, and even how well your brain functions. You know, the power 
Power Trio of Waking Life. Important things, as it turns out. Click the link below to get yourself a Marlow pillow and change the way you sleep. Shop there, buy more, save more deal. If you buy two pillows, you'll save 20%, buy four pillows, and you can save 30%. Gollum leads Frodo and Sam through the Dead Marshes, and this is one of my favorite locations, as these marshes were actually the site of the Battle of Daggerlad that we saw in the Fellowship Prologue. This is where the Last Alliance fought the forces of Mordor, and many of their corpses sunk into the water and became preserved, becoming the Dead Faces. So it's kind of like a creepy natural war memorial, but also does it in a way to like soberly warn everyone against waging any kind of war in the present. Actually, supposedly the image of these bodies under the water came from Tolkien's experience in World War One when he would find bodies in flooded shell holes. The extended edition includes this moment where Gollum spits out the Limba spread because he cannot eat elfish food, and he turns from Sam to Frodo. Rusty calls. Rusty. Ah, Gollum is hinting that these two, uniquely as ring bearers, they share a unique understanding of the ring's weight that Sam does not understand. So Gollum is appealing to him kind of like one addict to another. And I love how this scene ends with Frodo shoving Gollum off and Gollum just kind of catches himself and tragically just thuds his head in the mud. As they pass the corpses, we hear distortions of their screams from these past battles and Frodo gets entranced and he falls in and gets dragged down by these glowing green ghosts. These ghosts were not in the text, but Jackson wanted to bring to life Gollum's warning. Don't follow the lights. And the fact that Gollum says this tells us that he must have made the mistake of plunging into those waters himself before. It's kind of disturbing to imagine what had happened to Gollum or what deal he had to make to get out. Added in a pickup shot was this moment with Frodo petting the ring in his palm, and Gollum pantomimes the same in his hand, suggesting that the ring's hold on Gollum is so strong that Gollum can feel when Frodo is looking at the ring. Frodo asks Gollum about his background, and Gollum initially answers in this riddle. Folk call the heart and hand and bone, and call the travelers far from home. They do not see what lies ahead when sun has failed and moon is dead. This is actually adapted from the chant of the Barrow White from the text. Cold be hand and heart and bone, and cold be sleep under stone, never more to wake on stony bed, never till the sun fails and the moon is dead. In the black wind the stars shall die, and still on gold here let them lie, till the dark lord lifts his hand over dead sea and withered land. I like how they just found the creepiest things Tolkien had written and found a way to work it into these movies. Frodo calls Gollum by his original hobbit name, Smeagol, and his eyes widen into this vulnerable, livelier shade of blue as his soul briefly echoes back. The reason why his eyes are so beautiful here is originally this scene would end with us pushing in on Gollum's huge eyes and then here we would see the flashback with his cousin Daigle that day they went fishing but they removed it from this section and they used it of course as a prologue for Return of the King. I like this change because for now it leaves Gollum as more of a mystery. Frodo's unhealable wound fires up again as the Nazgul scream returns. Now the ring wraith rides this fell beast which Tolkien described as more of a bird than a dragon but in a letter to a fan he did describe them as more pterodactyl. I will remind viewers that this is one of the reasons they couldn't use the eagles to fly the ring to Mordor. They would have ended up in an aerial combat with one of these nightmares. In the forest of Fangorn, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli detect the approach of the white wizard that Eomer warned them about, and he gets a jump on them. You are tracking the footsteps of two young hobbits. They passed this way the day before yesterday. They met someone they did not expect. Does that comfort you? Peter Jackson actually mixed the voices of Ian McKellen and Christopher Lee, and he told those actors to vocally impersonate each other. And through this blinding light, Peter Jackson rotoscoped in the eyes of Christopher Lee. But doing this is not just plot misdirection, it's actually important that we see Gandalf the White with the kind of sheen and power that was previously unique to Saruman. Gandalf says that he is Saruman, or Saruman as he should be. Now before we talked about Tolkien alluding to Christ's resurrection from the New Testament, part of the resurrection myth was this period of uncertainty for the doubting Thomas to question these claims as a test of faith. Gandalf takes us back to his defeat of the Balrog on the mountainside because yes, he pursued this thing for 10 freaking days. And now Jackson visualizes his cosmic explanation of how he returned. Darkness took me and I strayed out of thought and time. The stars wheeled overhead and 
and every day was as long as a life age of the Earth. This was adapted almost fully from Gandalf's description in Tolkien's text, except they added Star's Field of End and implied that the time dilation that Gandalf experienced was on this cosmic plane, as opposed to after his life was restored on the clifftop and he was just kind of in a daze. But then the text actually goes further, talking about how the eagle, Gwahir the Windlord, found Gandalf and brought him back naked to Lothlorien, where Gandalf's health was restored with elven magic. Jackson said that he considered having Ian McKellen walking around naked in the snow of Lothlorien, but he opted not to get into all of that. What truly happened here was the god of this universe, Eru Elu Avatar selected Gandalf for his brave sacrifice and rebooted him with a greater power to help the forces of good fend off Sauron. He has a mission now. God has picked a side. And Gandalf is so transformed that he seems to have briefly forgotten his old life. Gandalf? Yes. That was what they used to call me. Gandalf the Grey. That was my name. Gandalf tells them to leave Merry and Pippin be, and instead to head to Edoras. The coming of Merry and Pippin will be like the falling of small stones that starts an avalanche in the mountains. We still speak in riddles. Except Gandalf is not speaking in metaphorical riddles here. Merry and Pippin's intervention with the Ents does lead to a literal avalanche when the dam breaks. Gandalf whistles to summon his horse, Shadowfax. I love Shadowfax. When Shadowfax trots up to them, Gandalf winks at the horse and Legolas tilts his head in respect in Gimli freaking bows and Shadowfax freaking bows back to everyone. Now I'm a horse boy. As they gallop toward Edoras, in the distance you can see flaming ruins. This is actually Westfold, a region that would have been attacked by Saruman's orcs and the wild men of Dunland. It's just a little detail to establish time running out in Rohan to mount a defense against Saruman. Frodo, Sam, and Gollum make it to the Black Gate. Longtime Lord of the Rings artists John Howe and Alan Lee designed this glorious gate, and I just love all the details and the complexity of how it opens, down to the leather straps on the shoulders of the trolls to keep the chains from chafing their skin. A group of Easterlings are marching through. Now, the Easterlings are coming from the west here, which is odd, because the Easterlings come from the uncharted lands of Rune, east of Mordor, but if you look at the maps of Middle-earth, there are really no roads in that area, and they sure as shit ain't crossing through Mordor to get to Barad-dur, so it makes sense that they would take the long way around and come up the Herod Road south of Gondor. But I mention this because just the direction the Easterlings are coming from tells you how hellish Mordor is. The ground beneath Sam's feet falls and Frodo goes after him, covering both of them with the elven cloak, which is a great little practical illusion that looks like a real boulder. And it just shows how effective elven material is. I just like this better than the absolutely insane Pita Malark makeup from Hunger Games. Gollum begs them not to go through the gate as Sauron will spot them. And really, Gollum would lose the ring. And offer an alternate secret route. And I love this detail of how Gollum desperately paws at Frodo's cloak while Frodo mulls this over. Like, you know that was something Andy Serkis did and they just kept it in. The extended edition includes this bit with Merry and Pippin drinking the water that causes them to grow a bit and they get attacked by the roots of one of the trees. This is one of the sentient trees that Treebeard actually shepherds and this is actually using a moment that the hobbits went through back in the fellowship part of the story that's in a different forest. Meanwhile, we arrive at Edoras. This was built atop Mount Sunday in New Zealand's Canterbury region with thatched huts that took six months to build. King Theoden is played by Bernard Hill, who previously played Captain Edward J. Smith in Titanic. In the disaffected way Hill played Smith's honorable final moments makes him perfect for this role as a king watching his country in decline under a trance that has kind of left him particularly hopeless. Hill's cursed appearance is designed to make him actually look more like Christopher Lee as Saruman, as it is Saruman's spell here that is corrupting him, though in the book it's really just Grima Wormtongue who is manipulating him without Saruman's magic. Grima makes a move on Eowyn beside the Theodred's deathbed. Who knows what you've spoken to the darkness in the bitter watches of the night. This line in the text is actually spoken by Gandalf to Eomer about Eowyn in the Houses of Healing in the book, and Aragorn says Eowyn's unhappiness began before she ran into the Witch King. It's really an amazing passage from Gandalf that Peter, Fran, and Philippa repurposed here to give Grima a greater conjuring power, and Brad Dourif plays it perfectly, and Eowyn nearly gives in. But as if she read the book and knows that the line is out of place, Eowyn's like, your words are a poison, and she trudges out of the balcony just as a flag tears off in the wind and floats down to Aragorn. Now this flag tore because the kingdom is crumbling. But in effect, it's kind of a romantic gesture if you think about it. A maiden tossing her kerchief down to a writer. But Peter Jackson said that this flag flying off the pole was just kind of a happy accident because Mount Sunday was so freaking windy. So later when we see the riders coming up to the gates, they added this detail of just throwing the flag past Aragorn and his horse to just kind of complete that accident. And of course, everything in Edoras is horse themed. There are horse heads everywhere. The castle bears Scandinavian design. Like notice these pillars are decorated with golden braids topped with horse heads. The braids are like their hair, the wooden pillars 
colors just kind of make it feel like we're in a Viking hall. And as we will see later, we even see joining horse heads on the cross guard of Theoden's sword. Like Frodo with his elven cloak, Gandalf disguises himself with a gray cloak of his own, tricking Grima Wormtongue into thinking he's still just the mere Gandalf the Grey. As he walks in, he cleverly angles the staff behind him so that only the staff head is showing, and he takes Legolas's arm so that the guards don't suspect that this guy could walk on his own. Yet in reverse shots, you do see Ian McKellen holding the staff upright. Theoden calls the wizard Gandalf Stormcrow, as in a crow flying in on the wings of a storm, a harbinger of bad news. In the text, Gandalf will embrace Grima's nickname by naming himself Gandalf Stormcrow when he arrives at the gates of Minas Tirith. But Gandalf reveals his staff, and Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli just go to work on these guards, but I love how Hama stops the other guard from intervening as he has been waiting for the day someone would wake Theoden the fuck up. Peter Jackson's background was as a horror director, and you can definitely see some of the influence of William Friedkin's The Exorcist here. If I go, Theoden dies. Yes, obviously the voice of Christopher Lee there. Gandalf casts out Saruman, and we get one of the smoothest ever transitions. I mean, just look at this. Bernard Hill was actually given four different stages of makeup, his normal self and then three layers on top of that, from cursed old man that looks vaguely like Saruman down to his normal face. So they had Bernard Hill act out this awakening four times in each of the stages of makeup, and then they had the digital effects team morph all four shots together. It's not like visual effects technology was better back then, it's just that they took more time with this stuff. Gandalf tells the king, Your fingers would remember their old strength better if they grasped your sword. Remember, Gandalf is a manipulator. He needs Theoden's strength and authority to cast out Grima Wormtongue and to try to mobilize Rohan to war. Aragorn stops Theoden from executing Grima, and there's this little moment where Aragorn offers a hand to help Grima up, and then Grima sees his ring of Barahir, and he spits on his hand and runs. Seeing this ring in this little moment is how he knows Aragorn is the heir of Isildur, and how he knows to relay this to Saruman later. For Theodred's funeral, the men carry his body, and they hand it off to the women at the graveside for the actual burial part, which is something they actually took from Maori culture. The lament that Eowyn sings is in the language of Rohanese, which they based on Old English, and these lyrics were translated by David Salo. We only hear the last four lines, and they translate to, An evil death has set forth a noble warrior. A song shall sing the sorrowing minstrels of Medusil, that noble cousin who always held me dear, now is held in darkness and closed. And that phrase, an evil death, is sung as the old English term, forgive me if I mispronounce this, Belaquam Hafo, which Philippa Boyens derived from the epic poem of Beowulf. This white flower that grows on the grave is Simbamine, and notice it grows only on the grave mounds. Theoden grieves, No parents should have to bury their child. Yes, these wars are taking the lives of the younger generation, leaving their parents behind to mourn them. Obviously, there's a word in the English language for orphan, but there's no word for the opposite, a parent who loses their child. It's just so unspeakable that our language cannot give shape to it. Gandalf advises Theoden, Draw him away from your women and children. You must fight. And notice how Theoden sees Gandalf's hand on the armrest of the throne. Grima had been doing the same thing, and this is what makes Theoden so wary of Gandalf's advice to confront Saruman's forces directly, and instead, he decides to retreat to Helm's Deep. And this is where the filmmaker's biggest departure from the text comes in, because at this point in the book, Theoden rides out to war, and he only ends up besieged at Helm's Deep when he considers helping Erkenbrand. The character of Erkenbrand was left out of these films. His character is really merged with Eomer as the Rohirrim general, who arrives at Gandalf's side at the end of the battle. Aragorn in the book supports going to Helm's Deep, but here in the film, they make him and Gandalf scoff at this as a bad strategic move. And that's because, since Peter, Fran, and Philippa merged pieces of the story together to get the Two Towers film, they needed Helm's Deep to be a much bigger climax, and thus needed Gandalf and Aragorn to feel uncertain about it to raise the tension. This is the hardest part of screenwriting, and it goes often overlooked. Just the math of piecing stories together. When movies don't do this well, you see that math, but not here. It works so well because the filmmakers write Great, great moments for the characters so that we don't really see any of the shifty machinery. Like Gandalf gets this revelatory beat where he laments that he used to be called the Grey Pilgrim and wasted 300 years milling about in life, and now he has only just a few days to rally the scattered Rohirrim, yet he promises to appear at the coming of the light of the fifth day, which is a little cryptic tease for people who don't know what's going to happen, because it makes us wonder, what does this old late bloomer still have up his sleeve? Meanwhile, for Aragorn, they wrote this scene where he fucking talks to a horse, and it's so good, because he begins trying to 
to calm the horse in Old English, aka Rohanese, but then he shifts to Elvish, showing how this guy has spent both time as a ranger and spent part of his upbringing with the elves in Rivendell. So he's really a horse boy in two tongues. And you know, Eowyn's like, you got a third tongue for me? But really they established this scene with Brago the horse so that Aragorn can let him run free and so that Brago can later find Aragorn on the riverfront to save him. We know it's the same horse because Eowyn calls him Brago here and then later Aragorn says his name. And yes, Vigo bought and kept this horse in real life. Now the extended edition includes Grima telling Saruman about the ring on Aragorn's finger to establish Saruman learning that Gandalf had found his Seelder's heir, which is interesting because the way things end up for Saruman in this movie, we don't really need him to learn that, but you know, it just gives us this great acting moment for Christopher Lee. It matters not. The world of men shall fall. It will begin at Edoras. Notice how Grima is dabbing his cut lip? They actually added this because they shot this scene six months before the shot of him being thrown down the steps of Edoras. And they assumed that he would probably like cut his lip, but alas, that never actually happens in the other shot. This shot of Gollum splashing after the fish in the stream was actually done by Andy Serkis in freezing cold water in his mocap suit. But it wasn't just a stunt to serve the technical purpose of getting the water splashes correct. Gollum madly thrashing like this, like an animal, serves Frodo and Sam's debate over whether ring bearers can ever be normal again. And as Smeagol, Gollum Gollum's journey began on a fishing expedition. He loses the fish here, and later in this film, he'll finally catch his fish, and he'll sing that goofy song, and that comes right before Frodo tricks him. So Andy Serkis knew that Gollum chasing a fish, and all of it looking real and savage, would actually be an important thematic beat, and that's why he committed so hard to it. So that scene, plus this next scene, should have won Andy Serkis an Oscar for this performance. At night, we see Gollum's two identities bickering with each other. Gollum with the wide, open, porous eyes, contrasting Gollum. Go, go the narrower, bitter irises. Actually, co-writer Fran Walsh shot this scene, and she smartly begins a sequence by swinging the camera back and forth with Gollum's head to establish what he is doing. But then Gollum looks directly into camera, and from here on, they switch to intercutting. Because Circus's performance was just so unnerving when he did it raw in camera swinging back and forth, they decided to break it up with intercutting shots like they would a dialogue scene. But it ended up being perfect because now we are in Gollum's head with him. And one detail I just noticed about the framing, from the vantage point of the sweeter Smeagol identity, Frodo and Sam are sleeping in the background behind his evil alternate self. So it's kind of like the more dangerous Gollum is blocking sweet Smeagol from his new friends and threatening their safety, holding them hostage from his other side. Gollum taunts Smeagol, calling him a liar and a thief, and then and the whisper is so real you can hear Andy Serkis's human voice creeping in through it. And that word is what gives Smeagol the nerve to cast Gollum out. Leave now and never come back! And notice how we break the clean intercutting and they leave in Smeagol starting to turn his head away from camera. So that illusion is breaking. This whole piece is a masterclass in acting and VFX artistry and camera work writing, and perhaps most importantly, editing. It's exactly how the different elements of filmmaking should work together in harmony. Giddy, after ridding himself of his dark passenger, at least for now, Gollum brings back two dead rabbits like a hunting dog, which Sam just stews. What we need is a few good taters. What's taters, Brussels? What's taters, huh? Potatoes. Gollum slips in a loose precious while asking Sam what taters are. And when Gollum spits, that's actually Andy Serkis' spit that they kept in the shot. But I think my favorite detail of this moment is the way Gollum relishes the idea of fish. Raw and flicklum. And he does this little eye roll, which is so specific and authentic. And it's just another moment setting up his theft of fish from the Forbidden Pool later. They spot a group of Haradrim, aka Southrons, marching with their Mumakil, which the hobbits named Oliphants. This name actually comes from an epic poem that's cited by Sam in the book, characters that are based on bestiary lore. So for him and Frodo, it's kind of like seeing a Jabberwocky in real life. But Gollum darkly states that their purpose is to carry out Sauron's last war. And we're seeing them here in Two Towers to remind us that beyond the showdown with Sauron's forces at Helm's Deep in this movie is another conflict with Sauron's alliance. And it gives us an even bigger conflict to look forward to at Pelennor Fields in Return of the King. Here we meet Faramir, brother to Boromir, son of Denethor, the steward of Gondor, he talks about this Southern he killed, and I love this moment. You wonder what his name is, where he came from, if he was really evil at heart, 
what lies or threats led him on this long march from home. Peter Jackson included this line in part as a defense of Tolkien, who has been criticized over the years of being pro-war. This is absolutely not true. He was haunted by what he experienced in World War I. But the fact that Jackson reassigns it from Sam to Faramir really can be seen as part of the changes they made to the Faramir character in the film. They wanted to soften him in this moment to offset the thirst he will later feel for the ring, which isn't true to book Faramir. In this way, we kind of start off the character with just a bit of goodness before the temptation begins. Meanwhile, on the march to Helm's Deep, Eowyn offers Gimli some stew, and he turns it down, kind of like Gollum spitting at Sam's stew. Oh uh, no, I couldn't. Which is great because Aragorn tries it and it's disgusting. But remember, Gimli had just been talking about how dwarves have a keen sense of smell, which is how Gimli knew that the stew sucked. This extended edition scene recalls how Aragorn rode to war with Eowyn's grandfather, Thengel, and it is confirmed that Aragorn is 87 years old. And that, of course, is because he's a descendant of Numenor, men who lived longer lifespans, about 150 years. So Aragorn is both middle-aged, but is far more experienced than the average man. Peter Jackson said he removed it because this would lead to a flashback with Aragorn back in Rivendell with Arwen, where they talk about him having immortal life, and they just didn't want to confuse audiences who didn't know Tolkien's lore. Like, is Aragorn immortal, or is he just really old? They just didn't have time to get into all of it. But this whole moment with Aragorn and Arwen is not in the text, but they structure in these vignettes with the two lovers to remind audiences that they are each other's destined soulmates. Otherwise, Arwen would really just not appear in Two Towers at all. And if the shot of Aragorn smoking his pipe looks familiar, it's because it was actually shot to be part of the scene with Aragorn and Gandalf earlier, talking about Frodo being an asset that Sauron wouldn't expect. So really, at this part of the movie, a lot of it is being constructed and moved around. And the fact that it works as well as it does is just a testament to these filmmakers. Like following this is another extended edition scene that is set right before Aragorn left Rivendell during the events of Fellowship, where Aragorn tries to return the Evenstar necklace, but Arwen forces him to keep it. And they do that so that they would have this prop to put in the orc's hand to make everyone think that Aragorn did go over the cliff. And yeah, it's just really interesting to see all this story math. Really, it is the hardest part of adapting a huge text into these movies, even into the extended editions. Now, this warg attack was actually written based off just a mere description of the orcs' mounts in the text, and they just needed an escalation scene. Actually, it was originally going to be set at Edoras, and it would have been why Theoden led a retreat from the city. This was back when the series was going to be just two movies at Miramax before New Line came in and encouraged them to make it a trilogy. They wanted to have a warg with its fur on fire, but they would have needed this scene to be at night, and they just couldn't figure out how to light it. But here in this scene, Legolas wows all of us by swinging onto a horse. Peter Jackson said that this happened because they didn't get a shot of Orlando Bloom jumping onto a horse since Bloom's rib was cracked. So they ended up just rendering a CG version of Legolas and had him pull a badass elf move. And to their credit, it's pretty hard to see where the real Orlando Bloom ends and the CG version begins. It's really just the physics that give it away and the fact that Legolas swings so low that definitely his feet would hit the ground unless he really tucked them in. But at the end of the day, he's an elf. They're kind of magical. The guy weighs less than Limbus. And I think he just wanted to hug the horse because he's a horse boy. Everyone's a horse boy in this movie. Peter Jackson has said that the warg attack was shot chaotically on the fly. He admits some of the CG doesn't hold up, but the shots that they did get on the fly demonstrates that they know how to stage great action. The opening cavalry charge swings the camera from one side, then to the other, as if we are positioned in the middle like a documentary crew terrified of being caught in the middle of this collision. This scene is also great because it establishes Gimli and Legolas's tallying game that they carry on through Helm's Deep. But that one comes as mine! Now, other than Legolas's swing, which I cannot help but love, the only shot I kind of take issue with is the speed and accuracy with which Aragorn spears the warg to save Gimli. Like, Aragorn is awesome. He looks great for 87, but he's not an elf like Legolas. He's a man. And I think he's more fun to watch when he's just, like, scrambling. Yes, he did have the badass move of flinging the torch to the Nazgul's face in Fellowship. I guess he gets one of these per movie. But pride goeth before the fall as Aragorn goes over the cliff, which, of course, is a fake out for anyone who hadn't read the text. But structurally, with all the changes they were making at this point in the movie with the journey to Helm's Deep, they needed this kind of all-is-lost moment for Theoden and the rest. Because remember, Two Towers is a story that tugs its heroes between two towers of hope and despair. So they arrive at Helm's Deep, and this set is just awesome. This is actually the first structure that artist Alan Lee designed for these films, and the miniature that he was building was actually used in sizzle reel footage to get New Line to fund these films. Lee's illustration of Helm's Deep from the book had an angular outer wall, but artist John Howe suggested a curved outer wall. This establishing shot that we see here is actually a one quarter square model, which is actually about 50 feet wide or 15 meters, and it was used in various forced perspective shots. Like 
Like here in this shot, the actors are actually far behind this wall, but they are made to look like they're right up against it and just much smaller than they actually are. The rock wall background of Helm's Deep was actually from Dry Creek Quarry near Wellington. Meanwhile, the stone walls of the fortress were made out of polystyrene, which is a cheap, lightweight material that when painted just looks like actual stone. Grima Wormtongue tells Saruman that the only way to breach this outer wall of Helm's Deep is a small drain hole, which Saruman plans to blow open with black powder. And it's just an interesting contrast, like the wizard Gandalf used black powder in his fireworks for amusement and joy, whereas Saruman uses this technology as a weapon of war. And Saruman unveils his forces in the tens of thousands. Peter Jackson said that Saruman's speech was actually meant to evoke Hitler's speech at Nuremberg in 1936. If you ever look at footage of that, it is terrifying. And Brad Dourif's reaction totally reflects that. Even though the actors were just looking at a blue screen here and hearing the sounds of like 30 or so crew that Peter Jackson had assembled to cheer for him, Brad sheds a tear. He is the audience here, showing the shock and the guilt for this character for what he unleashed and which side of history he has aligned himself with. Meanwhile, Aragorn floats down the river as he experiences this ghostly form of Arwen who prays, may the grace of the Valar protect you. And who do the Valar send? Brego! Horse boys are never alone. This is why Vigo bought this horse, because he slept in this horse's stable so that it would trust him enough to do the stunt. And we use this miracle with Arwen to swing back over to Arwen in Rivendell as Elrond tells her that it is time to leave Middle-earth and sail west for Valinor. On this tapestry are the two trees, Lorelin and Telperion, from Valinor, which brought light to the world before the sun and the moon were created. These were destroyed by Melkor and a spider in the wars of the First Age. Elrond shows Arwen a possible future of what growing old with Aragorn will look like. He will come to death, but you, my daughter, you will linger on in darkness and in doubt, as nightfall in winter that comes without a star. Ooh, this passage comes from Tolkien's appendices, and it's one of his most haunting pieces of writing. Technically, this would be the furthest into the future we see in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. That is Aragorn's tomb in Minas Tirith with the white tree carved into the side. It's both an image of hope that men will win this, but also an image of despair that Arwen will have to bury her love someday and watch the world rot. I am always devastated by this because as a story of hope and despair, what greater test of love is there than the chance of scoring just a few precious moments with another who might just someday leave you behind? We don't love so that we might stay with someone forever. We love because we cannot help but seize the moment. Hope just means blazing forth despite the apparent certainty of loss someday. Now, there's kind of this transitional point here, a telepathic chat between Elrond and Gladriel that was structured this way to give an audience a lay of the land and reestablish the ring in this movie, which doesn't really get used much in Two Towers because it's sleeping. This shot of Faramir looking at the map sets up Osgiliath as a separate location from Helm's Deep. Frodo and Sam are led away by Faramir's rangers. They're wearing full face blindfolds so that they could shoot this scene with the stand-in actors. Faramir tells Frodo that his brother Boromir is dead. The surging waterfall behind them might be what takes us into this dream sequence of Faramir and the River Anduin. This is actually adapted from Chapter 5, The Window on the West in Two Towers, where Faramir recounts his dream of seeing Boromir's corpse floating past him in a boat. Quote, It seemed to me as it passed under my gaze that it was almost filled with clear water, from which came the light, and lapped in the water a warrior lay asleep. A broken sword was on his knee. I saw many wounds on him. It was Boromir, my brother, dead. I knew his gear, his sword, his beloved face. One thing I only missed, his horn. One thing only I knew not, a fair belt, as it were linked golden leaves about his waist. Boromir, I cried, where is thy horn? Whither goest thou, O Boromir? But he was gone. The boat turned into the stream and passed glimmering on into the night, dreamlike it was, and yet no dream, for there was no waking. What a thrill it must have been for Peter Jackson to shoot this imagery with no dialogue and just let David Wynnum emote all of this on his face. One thing Tolkien wrote so well and Jackson included every bit of in these movies, the process of mourning, mourning brothers, friends, future spouses, children, Time wasted, even events we were not there to witness. I've always found it to be a beautiful coincidence in the English language that morning and morning are homophones, as if to suggest there's always the hope of a sunrise to end our despair. This film actually gives us that sunrise. Faramir recalls Boromir's victory to reclaim Osgiliath, the extended edition giving us this flashback with the family all together. Denethor praises Boromir but shames Faramir for nearly losing the city. Despite it being his fault, he gave him too few men, something that will come back and return to the king. And so this location is just established as a symbol of Faramir's disappointment to his father. It's what makes his decision to release Frodo and the ring such a powerful move, because he knows it will seal his fate in the eyes of Denethor as a failure. Denethor mentions the upcoming Council of Elrond and the ring, and we immediately see how it just corrupts these men. It is rumored the 
weapon of the enemy has been found. The One Ring. Everyone will try to claim it. Men, dwarves, wizards. We cannot let that happen. Howard Shore's ring theme worms its way back in, a half-completed promise that Gondor will never attain. Denethor tragically places his faith in Boromir's character, yet Boromir does fail at Emon Hen. Boromir wears the same clothes here that he wears when he arrives at Rivendell in Fellowship, because this moment is literally the beginning of a journey that will take him to the other characters. We see him looking up at the white flag of Gondor. This is likely what is on his mind when he later says this to Aragorn in Lothlorien. You ever seen his Aragorn? Thallion, glimmering like a spike of pearl and silver. Its banners caught high in the morning breeze. Again, this part of the movie is really just to set up a fuller arc for the character of Faramir, to want the ring at first, and then decide to let it go. Peter, Fran, and Philippa felt that if Faramir could just easily reject the ring, as he does in the book, that would diminish the ring's power. It's more interesting in this film that he is tempted and nearly gives in. Gollum fishes in the Forbidden Pool. The King Pool is now sun pools, juicy and sweet. Gollum's fish song was ad-libbed by Andy Serkis after he read verses in the Passage of the Marshes chapter. Gollum also references his fish song in The Hobbit as part of a riddle in his contest with Bilbo. They actually used the audio of Andy Serkis singing this in his mocap suit on the set because it's just delightfully off key and when they had him ADR it later, he just sang it too well. Notice how Gollum is cast in the moonlight here and there's just something about the gloomier nature of moonlight that makes the animation look more vivid on his skin than he does in daylight. The effect is that we just often remember Gollum during these moonlight scenes. Frodo tricks Gollum into getting captured, and once again, our poor guy is tortured. An earlier version of the scene would have had Gollum's fingers being trimmed, which is why later he's seen rubbing his fingertips in pain. And when he curls away from them, they added this wonderful bit of blocking. <laughs> why does he cry? Smeagol. Yes, notice how Smeagol uses his right hand to pet and to soothe his Gollum side. And this brings us to our opening clip. What did they steal? The savage chaos tells Faramir everything he needs to know about what Frodo is really carrying. Originally, Jackson planned to have a golemized version of Frodo that Faramir would see when he lifts the ring chain from Frodo's neck with the sword. They wanted to cast the ring as a metaphor for addiction, that even seeing addiction's physical effects is not enough to stop you from wanting it. So Aragorn makes it to Helm's Deep, and they prepare for Isengard's host to arrive. This shot of the causeway establishes some wonderful scenic geography. We see the front gate and the bridge, and then the curved wall behind, and then in the foreground, the little ledge that will later be where Aragorn and Gimli creep around to do the toss me maneuver. A few shots after this gives an even better sense of the layout, merging the digital outer wall with a practical facade that the actors walk upon. All of this just works together to make us feel like Helm's Deep is a real fortress that we could walk around, so that we feel that claustrophobia when the uruk reach it later. So when setting up this battle, Peter Jackson said that he was inspired by the 1964 film Zulu, which depicted the Battle of Rourke's Drift between a British Army detachment and the Zulu in 1879. Jackson said that with all great war movies, the buildup to the battle is as important as the battle itself. Aragorn begs Theoden to send out riders for aid, but Theoden just doesn't trust Gondor. Where was Gondor when the Westfall fell? Where was Gondor when our enemies closed in around us? Where was Gondor? Yes, we must imagine that Theoden was about to say, where was Gondor when my son Theodred was taken from me? Meanwhile, Mary Pippin and Treebeard assemble the Antmoot. These other trees were all designed by Alan Lee to reflect the biodiversity of tree species. We got a willow, we got an oak, chestnut, ash, etc. Their twisted faces and crooked noses come directly from Alan Lee's artistry style and his illustrations in the book Fairies. Meanwhile, the forces of Rohan move the women and children into the glittering caves, including this extra with blonde hair. This is actually Elijah Wood's sister, Hannah Wood. Meanwhile, the Rohan men who have seen two too many winters include cameos by Alan Lee and production designer Dan Hanna. Aragorn and Legolas argue over whether these men have any hope. Legolas switches to Elvish to spare their courage. Then I shall die as one of them. Aragorn's outburst in the common tongue sobers these men, yet also earns their respect. Gambling armors up King Theoden, who waxes poetic. Where is the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that was blowing? They have passed like rain on the mountains, like wind in the meadow. This poem actually comes from Aragorn in the King of the Golden Hall chapter of Two Towers back in Edoras. It's the lament of a modern day poet in Rohan thinking back on the historical figure of Errol the Young and how the best days of Rohan were behind them. 
And I love this, for all of Bernard Hill's lines here, they actually recorded him speaking in slow motion and then sped up the footage in post-production. And it results in Theoden's words having this kind of dreamy quality, kind of like we're back with Captain Smith watching the Titanic sink around him. How did it come to this? Aragorn sees these two boys. On the right is actually Viggo Mortensen's son, Henry, but the one he talks to is Haleth, son of Hema. Hema, the Edoras guard who got killed by the warg scout. He's played by a kid named Callum, who's the son of co-writer Philippa Boyens. Being Hema's son is why he's been around the other men who think that they won't survive the night. He's not as clueless as the other kids, but Aragorn reassures him. There is always hope. And a horn blows and the elves arrive. And notice how their marching doesn't sound as heavy because they're elves, they're lightweight. In the book, the elves do not come to Helm's Deep and they kind of drop out of the story at this point. Jackson and Boyens brought them in as a reference to how in the appendices of Return of the King, we learned that Galadriel and the elves of Lothlorien and Thranduil of Mirkwood were fighting other armies from the north during this time. And how later Elrond would send his two sons to Aragorn during Return of the King. So the elves are helping and they just wanted a way to dramatize that. It's also just so important thematically to inspire the audience with the hope of the last Alliance living on. An alliance once existed between elves and men. Long ago we fought and died together. We come to honor that allegiance. Now in earlier versions of this movie, Arwen would have joined this host after Arwen and Elrond visited Gladriel and Lothlorien. That scene being dropped is why the conversation between Elrond and Gladriel is just kind of like awkwardly telepathic. While nearly all of the shots of Arwen were removed from Helm's Deep, you can actually see her briefly as Aragorn leads the retreat when the fortress is breached. You can also see the moment before Aragorn crosses into that inner wall where Wetum painted her out, but accidentally left in her shadow. But before the battle begins, the uruk march in, in the storm sets in. Ah, the pings of the raindrops hitting the armor. It's these little details that make us feel like we are standing on the wall with them. Setting this battle during a storm might be the smartest visual choice Peter Jackson made, as it makes every surface reflective and allows us to see the texture of everything in the battle, make out all the shapes in the darkness, especially with these natural flashes of light from lightning. So nothing blends in with the background and we never get visually confused. It's part of the reason Steven Spielberg's T-Rex reveal in Jurassic Park looks so good even to this day, and why the opposite of this, the nighttime battle of winter fell in Game of Thrones season 8 was so hard to see. Even though they say that they modeled that battle on Helm's Deep, the fact that everything was dry and just kind of muddy made it impossible to make anything out. Meanwhile, we cut to families in the caves, including another cameo of Peter and Fran's children, Billy and Katie. Despite all the chest-thumping drama when the forces stand off against each other, the battle begins by accident. It's a brilliant gag because it's how many medieval battles likely began, especially in a case such as this when so many fighters were not trained soldiers. And I love how you could see this old man praying to himself moments before. And after the arrow hits at Urukai, he slumps forward and that arrow shaft slides up through his chest from the mud. So the battle begins and the volleys of arrow fly. It's so intense and there's this quick insert of an actor missing an eye. Peter Jackson said that they saw this actor with an eye patch and asked if he would remove the eye patch. And while the actor felt self-conscious at first, he later said that he felt better about his missing eye and just the open socket after seeing this powerful scream on the big screen. But notice how throughout the opening throws of this battle, we never get more than two or three shots without seeing Aragorn, Gimli, Legolas, or Theoden. This was Jackson's rule because he felt that if we went too long looking at stuntmen fighting, as good as the action looked, we would just lose focus on the hero characters whom we had spent the most time with leading up to this. And that's why in these opening sections, we just keep cutting back to Gimli, unable to see over the battlement. As the uruk High ladders breach the wall, we can see the main part of the fortress in the background, but the structure was actually a miniature that in reality was far closer to the actors on the wall. But using forced perspective, it looks like a much larger citadel further away. It's just a great balance of close quarters and immense scale. Despite the life and death stakes of this, the battle never loses its sense of humor. English! Two already! I'm on 17! Ah! I'm a goat pointy and outscoring me! Ah! Which is also the case for the cutaways to the end boot to pace out the battle with a slow deliberation by trees. And yes, it's meant to be frustrating. It creates this tension with the audience, but also it rewards us every time we revisit the battle. If it was just 40 minutes of battle, it would not have been as digestible to us. So the uruk pile some of Saruman's black powder charges in the drain, and a berserker uruk does his Olympic torch run. Aragorn screams at Legolas to bring him down, and Legolas, to his credit, if you notice, plunges two arrows on either side of the neck. Remember, he told the archer before 
sure that the Nizurkai were weak at the neck, but not this guy. Why? Because he doesn't wear armor, it would slow him down. His armor is his own musculature. He was bred for one purpose, to kamikaze and cause this. It is an awe-inspiring special effects spectacle that visually shifts the battle immediately for the viewer. Now we see the Urkai's true plan here, to overwhelm the defenders at the wall so there won't be enough forces to brace against the gate at the end of the causeway. Now Peter Jackson cameos as a soldier who throws a spear here, and I love this cameo because it feels like it is Peter Jackson himself swinging us from despair to hope. As the Urukai spill into the breach, Gimli dives over them through their spears, and that inspires Aragorn enough, giving him enough time to line up the archers and command this volley. And the way the camera glides into them, it is so sick. And moments after this, Legolas is like, you know what, I could be cool too. And he fucking skateboards a shield down the steps while firing arrows and then kicks that shield into another Urkai. It's crazy, but you know what? It's like the three corners of the Last Alliance are all unlocking a superpower that Middle Earth thought died with Isildur. They're all becoming superheroes just by inspiring each other. They're bringing out the best in each other. Throughout all of this, there's just such a good balance between fog of war, but also these little showcase hero moments where we know exactly exactly what is going on and where we are. It's both a realistic battle, but also one that is just unrealistic enough to make it fun to watch. But anytime we feel too hopeful about the battle, they hit us with despair. Like the death of the elf Haldir. The music here is The Lament for Haldir, sung by Scottish singer Elizabeth Fraser, who also sang The Lament for Gandalf in Fellowship. The Quenya lyrics we hear translate to, Out of a gray country, darkness lies, and all paths are drowned deep in sorrow. It's devastating to see Haldir react to his own mortality and to see rows of dead fellow elves. Elves never age, and if they didn't choose to engage in battle, they would never die. So this is just an especially brutal sacrifice they've made. But from this despair, we swing back to hope as Varagorn valiantly jumps on the ladder back over the wall and then swing back to despair as they breach the gate. Then back to hope with this lighthearted moment. I cannot jump the distance and have to touch me. Don't tell the elf. Not a word. Then back to despair as the Urukai wind up their giant grappling hooks, allowing them to raise giant ladders up the main wall. Then back to hope as Legolas fires an arrow to take out the cable of the central one to transform that ladder back into a crushing weapon against the enemy. Then back to despair when another grappling hook blasts a guy off his feet and they breach the keep. Notice when you watch this movie, these swings just get shorter and shorter and shorter in between, which smartly tricks the viewer into not losing focus between the swings. It creates a natural crescendo to the pacing. So you get like swing, 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 swing. And just when Peter Jackson runs out of swings to swing, we just jump away from the Battle of Helm's Deep right when they retreat to kind of leave it as kind of a cliffhanger over to the other subplots. Actually, in this shot of Faramir's rangers coming up upon Osgiliath, you can see that city on the river, but beyond it, you can see the city of Minas Tirith. But in the theatrical version of the movie, they removed Minas Tirith from the background because the studio got confused thinking that structure was Helm's Deep. Meanwhile, Pippin has successfully motivated Treebeard to war by showing him the southern side of Fengorn, just a bit of war propaganda to nudge them out of their isolationism. Actually, the extended edition includes this shot of a tree line literally moving to fight the orcs, in addition to the march of the Ents toward Isengard. The image brings to life the allusion that Tolkien made to Shakespeare's Macbeth, when the Mad King sees Macduff closing in on his castle, dressed with tree branches, and thinks that the witch's prophecy of the forest attacking him is coming true. Tolkien said that as a kid, he felt disappointed that it was just a hallucinated forest that attacks Macbeth, and he always wanted it to be a real forest. So Frodo and Sam join Faramir and Osgiliath as the Nazgul arrives. Now, Frodo and Sam do not not go to Osgiliath in the book. There, Two Towers climaxes with them fighting the spider, Shelob. But since Shelob was moved to Return of the King, they needed another climax for the characters in this movie. Meanwhile, the others are barricaded in the keep of Helm's Deep, and Theoden has descended into despair. What can men do against such reckless hate? Ride out with me. Ride out and meet them. This moment always gives me chills because Vigo just so perfectly plays that sudden remembrance of what his old friend had said. Look to my coming to the light on the fifth day. But what's so great about this is Theoden doesn't know what Aragorn is really talking about. He doesn't know Gandalf's promise. In his mind, he is just doing this for Rohan to recapture the glory of Errol the Young from his poem. And suddenly his mind is echoing with the verses of that poem. Where is the horse that was riding? Where is the horn that was blowing? Theoden finds the answers to these questions. The horse and the horn are right here. The horn of Helm Hammerhand shall sound in the deep. 
One last time. Now, Theoden is not thinking clearly here, but they don't want him to think clearly. Aragorn is manipulating him with the story of Rohan. Actually, he's getting Theoden to retell this story to himself. In rhetorical criticism, this process is called enthymeme. You try to persuade someone by just hinting something at them, forcing them to think back on some prior knowledge of history or literature that they have in their head, and you get them to convince themselves of the conclusion you want them to draw. For the character of Theoden, his two towers are not Isengard or Baradur. His personal towers are the the Mount of Edoras, where he had to bury his son and began to trap himself in this state of passive mourning in this movie. In the second tower, this fortress that he thought he could bury himself behind at Helm's Deep. And both of these towers must be toppled. While all the characters shine in this movie, I see two towers as fundamentally the story of Theoden, his journey from despair to hope, as foolish as that hope might be. Because hope by definition should not be grounded in logic. If Theoden can come back from the brink as a father who has lost a son, a word that the English language doesn't even give a word to. If he can come back, there is hope for all of us. And I just love that Peter Jackson took the captain from Titanic and recast him as this transformative hero. He declares, Fell deed, awake. Now for wrath, now for ruin, and the red dawn. This comes from a line spoken by Aylmer during Return of the King in the Battle of Pelennor Fields, but here they change Red Nightfall to Red Dawn because we are at the moment of daybreak. But in the book, Tolkien follows it with a mention of how Aylmer laughed at despair, which I always found so interesting now that the line is reassigned to Theoden, because this is perhaps the most apt moment for a character to laugh at despair throughout this film trilogy. So Gimli, so pumped, he blows the horn of Helm Hammerhand, and I love the dust dropping out of that horn, showing how long it has been since anyone blew it, and Theoden leaves it's a cavalry charge down the causeway, but this is one horse boy charge preceding the big horse boy charge of this movie as Aragorn looks up to the sunrise and sees Gandalf in Shadowfax, but that's not all. Theoden King stands alone. Not alone. Rohirrim! Horse boys, let's go! Now, what is so important to remember about the charge of the Rohirrim is, had Theoden not led the initial charge down the causeway out of the castle with Aragorn and the rest, Gandalf and Aylmer up on the hill might have just assumed from the erected banners of Saruman's white hand that the fortress had completely fallen, and they might not have led the Rohirrim charge down that hill. It's just a cool detail that shows us you must take a leap of faith to have your faith redeemed. Gandalf and Aylmer lead this charge down the hill, and they time it perfectly so that the rising sun behind them blinds the uruk at the right second. The light from Eru Iluvatar is a key component in thwarting this evil. Now, in the book, it's not Aylmer at Gandalf's side, it's Urkenbrand. Aylmer is actually fighting alongside Theoden inside Helm's Deep. But actually, in a shot after the battle, we do see Aylmer's double that was left in the shot before Carl Urban's face was painted over this guy's face. And while Peter Jackson says that this is just a Rohan writer, I like to consider this guy Urkenbrand. Meanwhile, the ants sack Isengard. This is a battle that was never shown in the books. It was only recounted later by Merry and Pippin. One ant with a big bark belly smashes two orcs together. I'm convinced the Marvel Cinematic Universe does not have Groot without Weta artists taking the time to bring these things to life. This close-up of Saruman glaring at the floodwaters was actually taken from a scene in Return of the King when a defeated Saruman glares at Wormtongue. The Ents withstand the flood, and the one who had caught on fire uses them to douse himself. Meanwhile, transfixed by the ring, Frodo faces down the Nod school in Osgiliath until Sam tackles him, and Frodo draws his sword on Sam and notice that they recreated the exact same framing of Frodo drawing his sword on Gollum in the opening act. Putting it here is just such a cool way of showing the ring's effect on Frodo in this film. The addiction has taken over. He has transformed. The sword was aimed at the monster before, and now he is the monster aiming his sword at his friend. And Sam realizes the insanity of this moment, and he forgives Frodo. By rights, we shouldn't even be here. Yes, it is a meta line, because in the books, Frodo and Sam do not go to Osgiliath. In screenwriting, we call this hanging a lantern, where you deliberately call attention to a choice in a script viewers might roll their eyes at to let them know that you do this intentionally. And the intention here was this Beautiful speech by Sam. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered. Now, I can't show the whole clip, but I just need you to go watch this clip. In fact, begin every day watching the scene. Because Sam talks about how the best stories are full of darkness and danger, where you don't want to know how they end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was? But it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. Now, the screenwriters actually adapted this passage from Sam in the Stairs of Sirith Ungol chapter in Two Towers, where Sam even goes into the story of the Cimmerillion and realizes that they are part of that same story. But Fran and Philippa adapted these words to thematically link our scattered fellowship in this movie on a shared path from despair to hope, and to more clearly crystallize Tolkien's point about the power of narrative, why we need stories. 
folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. That there's some good in this world, Mr. Fertile. And it's worth fighting for. As someone who has spent my entire professional career analyzing stories, revisiting stories that I grew up with, being criticized for thinking too hard about stories or drawing too much meaning from stories, and for anyone else, all of you out there who have ever felt uncool for caring too much about a book or a film or a YouTube video, we are seen. Here is Samwise Gamgee carrying us and validating us for looking to stories to guide us through our lives. We need stories because they teach us how to find that obscure tower of hope while we are engulfed in the shadow of the tower of despair, because that is only a passing thing, the shadow. Now, perhaps the most impressive visual choice about the sequence is to follow there's some good in this world and it's worth fighting for by cutting to, of all characters, Gollum. Gollum hears this speech and he listens to that question and the answer to the question saddens him because he realizes that in the battle for Frodo's heart, Sam has the better answer. And that goodness is something that is now a complete stranger to Gollum. He is unable to hold on to that. Now it's crazy to learn that most of the speech was Sean Astin recording it via ADR to play over the shots of the other characters celebrating. The filmmakers knew Astin could pull it off because he did the same thing as Mikey in the Goonies. Down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. But also hearing the speech, Faramir decides to release them and to let the ring go. And Sam says, Captain Faramir, you've shown your quality, sir. These specific words hit so hard with Faramir, who knows that his father, Denethor, will never forgive him for this. And now he's just gonna have to hold on to the Hobbit's definition of quality instead of Denethor's definition. A chance for Faramir, Captain of Gondor, to show his quality. I think not. Chance for Faramir, Captain of Gondor, to show his quality. Now, the Two Towers Extended Edition includes a few lighthearted moments that would have padded out the post Helm's Deep denouement. The encroaching tree line from before now consumes the fleeing Urukai from Helm's Deep. Legolas and Gimli finish off their hit counts by tying at 43 when Legolas arrows the orc Gimli was sitting on, which is twitchy because his axe was embedded in its nervous system. Merry and Pippin find Saruman's storehouse in his Shire imported pipe weed, proving him a complete hypocrite for toke shaming Gandalf and Fellowship. There's also a fun callback where Pippin finds an apple and he looks up, thinking it another heaven apple, like Aragorn's apple in Fellowship. But we end this Two Towers film with Sam, Frodo, and Gollum. The extended edition had included a few foreshadowing moments with Faramir warning them about a dark terror in the path past Minas Morgul and Gollum and Sam seeming to make peace to give us some hope before we end with Gollum dragging us back into despair. Kill them both. We could let her do it. She could do it. And then we take sick once they're dead. The filmmakers felt they had to end with this to signal to book readers that the spider Shelob was indeed coming in the next movie. And this shot was a complete technical feat. At the time, it was the longest continuous CG shot ever with two unbroken minutes of Gollum plotting to himself. Another incredible performance by Andy Serkis. So really we leave two towers suspended between hope versus despair with a final shot that cranes up to our second tower, Baradur with Eye of Sauron and an additional tower beyond it, Mount Doom. It's just a chilling message that no matter how many times we think we defeat despair, there will always be another tower of despair beyond it. But the final exchange between Sam and Frodo brings us back to this theme of the power of story and why we need stories. I wonder if people will ever say, let's hear about Frodo in the ring. Frodo was really courageous, wasn't he, Dad? Yes, my boy. And Frodo responds that Sam left out the chief character. Samwise is a brave. I want to hear more about Sam. Indeed, as we will learn in Return of the King, Sam is the true Lord of the Rings. He's not just the Sancho Panza of the story, he is the ring bearer bearer that none of us could get through our lives without. Frodo's uncertainty over the future is really an inverse of Arwen's vision. That was a mix of hope that Gondor would prevail over Mordor, yet tinged with despair that Arwen would still have to be alone in the future. Frodo's feeling is a mix of despair that he personally will fail, but hope that his soulmate will never leave his side. Two Towers might be the least beloved of the three films, but it's the most impressive victory for the filmmakers. A middle chapter scrounged together from what was supposed to be just two films, using a mastery of 
of script structure and film editing to jigsaw shots from elsewhere in the trilogy and dialogue from other parts of Tolkien's libretto to alchemize an epic that works fully on its own. Every scene, iconic. Of these three films, it is two towers that must be studied by every filmmaker who's tasked to franchise projects where storytelling starts to feel like building an Ikea bookshelf. Two Towers proves that your Natal can be a majestic horse-engraved bureau fit for an Edoras throne room. How you remember that every story, no matter how trite, can be the one thing that gives hope to some poor soul out there fighting out of a pit of despair. And to you, viewer, I thank you so much for being my Samwise Gamgees as we bear this ring all the way to its destined end. Return of the King Deep Dive is coming next in the month of March. Subscribe to this Deep Dive channel. Support us with one of these amazing Lord of the Rings shirts that we have. Horse Boy, worth the deep dive, or One Ring to Rule Them All. You can get all three at nerdriot.shop. I'm Eric Voss, and I will see you next time, my divers of the deep.